Since the dawn of civilization, humanity has sought to explore and expand outwards. Once all the continents on Earth have been mapped, there was nothing left to do but turn our attention towards the heavens. We sought to follow in the footsteps of the great explorers that circumnavigated the globe, climb the highest peaks, and, well, let's just be honest, we were actually just looking for ways to kill one another. NASA was founded in 1958 as a direct response to the Soviet Union launching the world's first ever satellite. It was feared that having satellites orbiting the planet would give the Soviets a powerful and potentially unstoppable method of deploying nuclear weapons. So the United States was quick to respond. The space race and the initial moon landing were born out of Cold War fear, not because humans are natural explorers. Sorry. That's not to say there weren't a lot of scientists and others who were genuinely interested in exploring and the scientific knowledge that could be gathered by landing on the moon, but traveling to the moon is pretty expensive. Without the underlying geopolitical pressures, there wasn't a lot of government interest in funding these projects. This is pretty evident by the more than two decade break that was taken in missions to the moon, crude or otherwise. Once it became clear that the Soviets weren't going to land people on the moon or send any further missions there, it was deemed mostly pointless for the United States to continue the Apollo program. There may have been plenty of science left to do, but it was hard for the government to justify the spending. Starting in the 1990s, probes again began being sent to the moon. This time, China, Japan, and India joined the list of nations performing research, but these probes were deliberately crashed into the moon. It wasn't until 2013 that China became the third nation to perform a soft landing on the moon, deploying their U-2 moon rover. The rover was only able to row for 100 meters before becoming immobilized, but it was still able to gather data afterwards. It was also the first soft landing since the Soviet Union's Luna 24 back in 1976, and totally coincidentally, the United States announced their intention to send people back to the moon shortly after China's successful landing. But that brings us to the most recent attempts at a moon landing, something that the media has portrayed as a new space race between Russia and India. So let's look at how these attempts differed, how they both failed, and what makes these particular missions so important and well what it all means for the future Russia's Luna 25 and India's Chandrayaan 3 both were seeking to make the world's first ever soft landing on the moon's South Pole. This particular location is important for a couple of reasons. To start, people have already landed on the moon. If they wanted to make international headlines, they were going to need to up the ante by doing something new. Sure, they could land on the same dumb, boring part of the moon as everybody else, but this was going to be a brand new challenge. The terrain on the lunar south pole is much more treacherous, thanks to the combination of craters and mountains. Not only does this make the areas that are suitable for landing much smaller targets, they're also difficult to see. The uneven terrain casts large shadows across the pole, so identifying where is actually safe to land is an extremely difficult task. But it's those same shadows that make the South Pole of great scientific interest. Multiple previous missions, including Chandrayaan 1, have proven the existence of water on the moon. However, thus far, that water hasn't been particularly useful to us. There are individual water molecules scattered around the moon's very thin atmosphere, and there are also water molecules present in the soil. The exact prevalence of water varies, but it's been measured as between 10 to 1,000 parts per million. That's not ideal if you want to extract water, but there is evidence that there are larger deposits of water ice hidden away in the shadowy areas on the moon's poles. Being the first to discover easily extractable deposits of water ice on the moon would be huge for whichever nation was able to do so. Not only would it give them scientific bragging rights, but being the first to successfully land on the pole would also give that nation a head start in extracting that water. The water could not only be used as drinking water for astronauts, it could also be broken down into its components to provide oxygen for astronauts to breathe and hydrogen to use as rocket fuel. This could turn the moon into a sort of refueling station for longer voyages. And it's important for nations to get there first because the water is going to be first come, first served. Now, on Earth, water is considered a renewable resource when managed properly. While the moon's normal ecosystem would make water a renewable resource as well, that wouldn't really be the case if we were extracting all of it and taking it away. And with various organizations already making plans to put boots on the moon, having the exact location of extractable water ice would be essential. Aside from the importance of landing on the South Pole specifically, either mission being successful would be huge on the world stage. Either India or Russia could claim the title of fourth nation to land on the moon. Now you might be thinking, well wait a minute, Russia was already the first country to successfully land a craft on the moon back in 1966. But while people often view them as interchangeable, that wasn't Russia, it was the Soviet Union. 
union. That may seem like pedantic nonsense to most, but we already mentioned that geopolitics plays an overly important role in space exploration. Vladimir Putin is certainly well aware of that distinction, and with recent events beginning to call into question whether Russia still deserves its status on the world stage, the fate of the Lunar 25 mission is of increased importance. But even though it's impossible to discuss any supposed space race without at least mentioning the geopolitical factors involved, well, you came here for science. So let's look at the two different plans and how they both played out. So, one of the main reasons the Luna 25 and Chandrayaan 3 missions were being viewed as a space race, aside from having roughly the same target location, is because of the timing. Chandrayaan 3 launched on July the 14th, while Luna 25 didn't launch until almost a month later on August 10th. Despite this, Luna 25 was actually scheduled to land on the moon's south pole multiple days before Chandrayaan would. Chandrayaan took a much more circuitous route, hence its longer time to arrive. It circled the Earth in an increasingly high orbit until it transferred to orbit around the moon. From there, it slowly lowered its orbit until it was close enough to deploy the Vikram lander to attempt touchdown on the moon. While this was a much longer journey, it was also more fuel efficient, which helped reduce the total cost of the project. Luna 25, on the other hand, took a much more direct route. This wasn't a quick decision made specifically to race the Indian spacecraft, especially since Luna 25 has been in the work for years. They just chose a different option. The route wasn't dissimilar from how the Apollo missions traveled to the moon, just with a different proposed landing point. As for the landing dates themselves, Themselves, that was chosen entirely because of the sun. Both Vikram Lander's Pragyan rover and Luna 25 itself, as the latter did not contain a rover to reduce the total weight, were equipped with solar panels. This meant that the ideal time for both to land was as soon as the sun was rising to begin the lunar day. Since Luna 25's intended landing spot was further east, it was able to attempt landing on August the 19th. The Russian craft was also equipped with a radioisotope thermoelectric generator, also referred to as a nuclear battery. This would have allowed it to remain operational into the lunar night, and it was expected that it would be functional for at least one one year. Unfortunately, there was an equipment malfunction during the initial approach to the moon. One of the engines was supposed to fire for 84 seconds, but it wouldn't shut down and instead fired for 127 seconds. This gave the lander far too much speed for a soft landing, and Luna 25 crashed into the surface. On August the 23rd, it was time for India's Vikram lander to make its attempt. Utilizing two onboard cameras, the lander was able to determine a suitable location to land. It successfully touched down and deployed its Pragyan rover. So why did India succeed where Russia failed? Now, for the sake of science, the ideal situation would have been for both the Russian and Indian missions to be successful. However, the results aren't necessarily surprising. Originally named Lunar Glob, the Lunar 25 lander was renamed to show that it was meant to be the successor to the Soviet lunar program. And while Lunar 24 did make a soft landing on the moon, that was in 1976. It's been a long time since then, with no additional practice, and this was a much harder landing. Mistakes and system malfunctions are inevitable, and nobody has gotten it right on their first try, which this effectively was for Russia. As for India, the name Chandrayaan-3 obviously didn't come out of nowhere. People may not remember or may not have been as excited at the time because it wasn't being framed as a race in the media, but this was India's second attempt at a soft landing on the lunar south pole. Chandrayaan-2 attempted a landing back in 2019 that ended much like Russia's recent attempt. Whether it was overconfidence or just a simple oversight, Chandrayaan-2 Vikram lander could not be controlled by mission control. It veered off course during its initial descent, and mission control had no means by which they could readjust its trajectory, resulting in a crash. But don't worry, you can always repeat. We learned from our mistakes, hence the addition of the cameras, so that the subsequent Vikram lander would know how to redirect itself. Because the Pragyan rover is exclusively solar-powered, it was only expected to operate for one lunar day, which is 14 Earth days. At the time of writing, the daylight has passed, and it's currently the 14-day lunar night. However, there's always a chance that the Pragyan might wake back up. Both it and the Vikram are currently in sleep mode, with their solar panels aimed directly where the sun will rise. It's unclear how likely it is that they will be able to wake it back up, but there may be more data to come from India's moon rover. Until then, let's take a look at what we've learned so far. Now, a lot of data was gathered by Pragyan, but we'll answer the big question first. It did not locate a source of water ice. Of course, much like China's first U-2 rover, it only traversed about 100 meters. Pragyan is exploring treacherous terrain, so if it does wake up, there's no telling how much further it will be able to explore, but thus far, the location of any ice deposits remains a mystery, assuming they really are hiding in the shadows on the moon's poles, as is expected. The next thing we learned is something we pretty much already knew, though this is the first time that we've been able to take direct measurements on the the South Pole. It turns out that the moon's soil is a terrible conductor of heat. 
During the day, the surface temperature of the moon was over 50 degrees Celsius, that's 122 Fahrenheit, but just a few millimeters below the surface, that temperature dropped to minus 10 Celsius, that's 14 Fahrenheit. That part wasn't a surprise. However, scientists were surprised that the temperature on the surface rose as high as 70 Celsius, or 158 Fahrenheit. But the biggest news came from utilizing Pragyan's Laser-Induced Breakdown Spectroscope, or LIBS. LIBS has been used in laboratory settings for decades, though the technology has now advanced to the point where the systems can be shrunk down for use as a handheld tool or a lunar rover attachment. The way LIBS works is by emitting pulses from a high-powered laser on a very focused area. Each individual pulse may only last for a few nanoseconds, but it heats the sample to temperatures over 10,000 degrees Celsius, briefly turning the sample into plasma. This causes the electrons in the atoms to move to a more energetic state before quickly cooling and returning to their original orbits. This results in the emission of element-specific wavelengths of light that can be mapped out using spectrographic analysis. Analysis of the lunar surface showed the presence of sulfur and rare earth metals. While it was already known that the moon contained sulfur, this was the first time that it was detected on the South Pole. Other elements detected included aluminium, calcium, chromium, titanium, manganese, silicon, and oxygen. But alas, no hydrogen, and thus, no water. Some scientists believe that it's unlikely that Pragyan could find water so close to the surface. But if it successfully wakes up, it could always get lucky. There were also seismic readings taken, though there was little detected beside the vibrations caused by the rover itself. And of course, there was also a newly discovered crater on the South Pole. The crater, which measures 10 meters in diameter, is assumed to have been created by the crash landing of Luna 25. Now, although the information gathered doesn't appear to be shocking or mind-blowing, as of yet, successfully landing on the rough terrain of the South Pole is an incredible feat. However, there are two major developments that stem from India's success, one geopolitical and one scientific. On the geopolitical end of things, one month before Chandrayaan-3 began its journey to the moon, India became the 27th nation to sign the Artemis Accords. While it is a non-binding agreement, the most important part is that it shows India's commitment to transparency and to share scientific information. The Accords or were set up to facilitate the Artemis program, an American-led program to get humans back on the moon by 2025, which is planned to be a multinational effort. China and Russia, both notably, have not signed the accord, though that doesn't mean they aren't open to scientific collaboration. U-22 is currently the longest-lived lunar rover and the first rover to traverse the far side of the moon, and China hasn't really been keeping its findings secret, at least as far as we know. Russian scientists may also be more eager for exchanges of information, given the results of their mission. But the major scientific development is how inexpensive the Chandrayaan-3 mission was. Space travel has been steadily decreasing in price with technological advances, but India was able to take things to a whole new level. Part of it was the savings in fuel by taking the slower, more scenic path to the moon. Their mission cost only $75 million. They were able to fly and land on the fucking moon for half as much money as it took to make the Barbie movie. There's definitely a lot for the rest of the world to learn from that example.